Hey everyone and welcome to Talk ETFs, our weekly video series here at ETF.com. My name is Sumi Roy and I'm Senior Analyst at ETF.com and I got a great guest lined up for us today. Elizabeth Kastner is the Director of Global Fund Research at FactSet. As some of you might know, FactSet is the data provider at ETF.com, so few people follow the ETF data as closely as Elizabeth. Elizabeth, welcome to the show. Good to see you, Sumi. So Elizabeth, you follow the ETF data very closely, of course. In 2022, we saw $600 billion plus worth of inflows for US listed ETFs. And so far in 2023, we're seeing that strong pace continue. Where is the money headed? All really great and timely questions to me. Um, you know, I think it's really notable, as you said, like that, that $600 plus billion inflow. Um, that's the second best year ever for ETF inflows. Um, and, you know, I think it should probably put paid to the argument of some who say, oh, you know, ETFs are great for when the market is rising, but, you know, obviously you're going to want a, a, a steadier hand on the tiller in falling markets. You know, that's really not what we saw in 08, and it's definitely not what we saw in 22, right? We, we've seen just the opposite. You know, d despite the um, uptick in interest in actively managed ETFs, the core ETF investor is still somebody who's going into a broad-based, cap-weighted, beautifully boring product, right? A, 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 yeah. a, a, you're going to know what you get. You're getting market exposure. And, you know, that hasn't really changed, but it has been mixed up a little bit this year. Uh, because we have seen kind of an uptick in um, tactical investing a little bit. Once you get below the, you know, the top two or three ETFs for inflows, you start to get things that are a little bit quirkier. Um, you know, you're getting some very short dated treasuries some very long dated treasuries, some dividend strategies. Um, you don't usually see those tactical funds floating to the near top of the list. So, you know, that was different. Interesting. Now, we always see the IVVs and the VOOs of the world pull in a lot of assets, but are we seeing any smaller ETFs gaining traction? You know, Simi, um, I think when you look at um, an increase in market share, like where a fund maybe had a small market share, but managed to really jump up, I looked at funds that increased their market share by more than 5% in 2022. And that started out kind of small with their assets below a billion, um, but sort of punched above their weight and brought in a billion more than you would have expected just based on their market share. Um, I saw something really kind of interesting. Three of the four funds that passed that criteria were products that um, iShares has had on the shelf for some time. And this was just their moment arrived. So there's SGov, which is a very short-term T-bill, zero to three months. T-flow, which is floating rates. Um, and IFRA, which is an infrastructure fund. The first two, obviously, a response to um, the current interest rate environment and the last to the infrastructure bill. So, you know, I, I thought that was really interesting. And it was kind of a, a testament to um, patience, right, on the part of BlackRock that, um, and, and not just BlackRock, I think there's a lot of asset managers that have interesting product that's sitting on the shelf that's waiting for its moment. The larger ones can afford to wait, the smaller ones really can't. That's actually a great point. If you have the right product at the right time, then you just never know what's going to happen. And speaking of SGov, I was actually looking at that ETF a while back, and even though we have SHV on the market, that ETF has just a tiny bit of interest rate risk because it's a little further out on the maturity curve. So SGov kind of fills that need for completely risk-free treasury exposure. And essentially it's the closest you can get to a money market fund in an ETF wrapper. For sure. And you know, for years we've been seeing success for the cash equivalent products, which are often actively managed and have a, a wider mandate. They don't just have to be treasuries. They could be in corporates. They could be in repos, right? All kinds of, uh, of uh, different choices out there. Um, those guys have been actively managed because of the, in part, because of the difficulty of indexing 
for very short term paper. Yeah. Um, but I thought that that was really interesting. Um, and then the fourth one on that list was um, a dimensional fixed income fund. And I think that's really a testament to um, the loyalty of dimensionals clients to their own products. Now, Elizabeth, I want to touch on launches. You and I both know that every year ETF issuers try to push the boundaries in terms of innovation in the ETF space. But has anything truly caught your eye? Honestly, Sumi, there was a lot of noise in 2022. Mm -hmm. And that's not that different from 21 or 20 or 19 or 18. Um, it goes back to the creativity that you're citing because the ETF market is really highly saturated. At this point, we have over 3,000 funds. We have uh, something like 270 different firms offering product in the ETF space. And the most desired funds, the core portfolio building blocks, those you know are all very long established from the late 90s or the early 2000s. And so asset managers who want to break into the space have to be creative because there's nowhere else for them to go. Um, and there's been really, I'd say, an extraordinary burst of creativity. But to what end, right? That's my question. And so my favorite new idea of 2022 is actually a favorite new idea of 21. It's the, the last time I think we saw something that was... a uh, revolutionary in terms of giving the investor uh, more bang for the buck. Um, and that's a fund called VOTE. The ticker is V-O-T-E. It's the engine number one um, U.S. equity product. Um, its creativity is not in its economic exposure. It's very standard, large, mid-cap, cap-weighted exposure. Its creativity is that um, they're very upfront about the exact principles that they're using for shareholder voting. And so anyone who buys that ETF is in a sense reclaiming the power of shareholder vote because they're taking it away from the corporate governance desk at whatever other asset manager that may have you know, many different considerations in the corporate governance vote and they're putting it into a place where it's aligned with their values. That's super interesting. It did spill over into the ETF space in 2022 as well as we're starting to see BlackRock, for example, begin to offer its institutional clients the ability to vote their own shares. But I, Vanguard is starting to have its clients add apps to allow them to do proxy voting. And so I really think that the next customer-centered revolution in ETFs is not about economic exposure. It's about corporate governance. Fantastic. Well, a ton of great information, Elizabeth. Thanks so much for joining us.